Um, hey, if you've got a Bible there, collection of ancient documents, do me a favour, turn with me very quickly to the book of Psalms. I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to pray for us very quickly. Uh, Lord, I want to thank you uh, again, God, for your word. Father, your word is living, it's active, it's powerful. Uh, God, I want to thank you, Lord, that you uh, instruct us, God, in, in the ways of life, God, not just... Uh, Lord, this separation of the spiritual world and the natural, but God, you bring those things together because the whole of life is spiritual. And so, Father, I just pray right now, Lord, as we open up your word, as we have a look at some, some things in there, Lord, would you open our eyes, help us see something we haven't seen before. God, unpluck our ears so that we can hear something we haven't heard before, God, that when we walk out of here today, Father, we would know that we are just a little more passionate for you, a little more on fire for you, God. We're, we're more curious about the reality of God. We're more connected to the plans and purposes of who you are, God. We see you clearer. Father, we ask this this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 Um, just during worship, I was just reminded... Oh, where's my glasses? That's why I can't read anything. During worship this morning, I was just reminded of the Psalms. And um, this is not... This will lead into what I want to talk about. We've been uh, on a bit of a journey recently. We've been talking about uh, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about uh, walking with and doing this Christian journey with the Holy Spirit. The gift that Jesus said that when I go, I won't leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you my spirit. I'm going to place my spirit inside of you. The idea of trying to live the Christian life in our own strength is, is a road that leads to failure. Amen? We can't do it. And the beautiful thing is that God never called us to purely rely on our own strength and our own intellect and our own abilities to try to live out this Christian life. Jesus said, I'm going to place my spirit in you and my spirit's going to guide you. He said, my spirit's going to lead you. My spirit is going to glorify Jesus. Uh, he said to the disciples, don't go into all the world and preach the gospel yet. Wait till the Holy Spirit comes upon you and I will empower you to go and do those things that I've called you to do to try to reach the world. And so the Holy Spirit is a very, very important part of our world. Yet for many of us, the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit is probably one of the most neglected parts of our faith walk. And so we've been spending probably the last couple of months just dancing around who the Holy Spirit is, uh, looking at uh, different things that Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit. And we've landed in a place where we're now talking about three things that the Word of God tells us we shouldn't do with the Holy Spirit. That is to uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, do not quench the Holy Spirit, and finally, do not resist the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about uh, quenching the Holy Spirit. And I want to continue down that vein a little bit uh, this morning. But while we were in worship, I was just reminded of um, Psalm 103. And that's not in the notes up there. I didn't give it to the people up the back. But Psalm 103, excuse me. David says this. He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Who's he speaking to? David's speaking to someone in that moment. He's speaking to who? He's, bless the Lord, O oh, your soul. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul. David's speaking to himself. And, and it's, it's almost like when you read it, he's, and he goes on, he goes, bless the Lord, don't forget his benefits. He does this, does that. There's this sense in which David is almost reminding himself that, hey, you know what? I don't know what's going on in the moment there with David. Sounds to me like maybe he's having a bit of a flat patch. But he, he speaks to himself and he says, Hey, hey, self, I, probably all these things are going on. I understand you might be feeling a bit flat, but I'm just going to encourage you. Hey, don't forget God is with you. Don't forget God is for you. Don't forget the benefits of God. And there's a sense in which he's really stirring himself up, saying, Hey, don't allow yourself to stay down. Stir yourself up. Get your focus and attention back on the goodness of God, what God is doing, where God is, who God is, and so on. And it was interesting because during worship, we were, we were there during worship, and um, obviously it was a different kind of an expression of, or way of doing worship. We, we normally have the band up there. But uh, it might have been many of you sitting there, and you might have found it a bit weird, and you might have got a bit, a little bit held back a little bit because maybe it, you know, just didn't have the feel, or you held back a bit because it wasn't loud enough, and you didn't want the guy next to you to hear your voice when bang, Ben's banging on the drums. It's nice and loud, and you, they don't hear you. But then maybe you, and and, and I, was, I was there in that moment thinking, you know, even for me, this is kind of not my normal thing. But you know what? I've got to stir myself up a little bit here and step into worship, regardless of whether I've got this kind of thing going on or not. And, and, and I remember being in mud huts in India where we had somebody that had no music training whatsoever, just banging a drum, sitting on a 
a floor in a mud hut with a candle and people entering into it real ecstatic and lively and energetic worship and connecting with God and realizing that you know there, there are times in life where circumstances will line up perfectly for you and you'll find it easy to just flow into what God has for you and you'll find it easy to, to maintain your faith and you'll find it easy to walk with Jesus. You'll find it easy to witness for Jesus. You'll find it easy to believe in faith for this, that and the other. But there are going to be seasons in life where you won't. Amen. There are going to be seasons in life where it's difficult, it's tough, and it's hard. And when we're in those moments, what do we do? Do we allow the season to dictate the way we're going to move forward? Or do we do what David did and recognize, okay, this season might be a bit flat here, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stir myself up in God. I'm going to remind myself of who he is, what he's capable of, where he is. I'm going to remind myself of, of the character and the nature so that instead of going down this path, I can pick myself back up, stir up God on the inside of me, and move forward into what God has for me. And that's what I think David's doing here. We've been talking about quenching the Holy Spirit. And last week we looked at uh, uh, that in relation to how we manage the prophetic uh, in in, in our life and in the life of the church and so on. This week I want to sort of uh, flip it a little bit, I guess. If we have the capacity to quench the Holy Spirit, then I think the Bible teaches us we also have the capacity to stir up the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. If we have the capacity to quench that which the Spirit of God wants to do in our lives, we also have the capacity to stir up that gift of the Holy Spirit and to stir up what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. Sometimes I think we live with this Doris Day theology, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Uh, and, and you know, if God wants it, God will make it, and God this and God that. And I believe that, that there are things that God just wants to do, and he's just going to do them. And if you look at the history of the world, you'll see that. Jesus was going to come. Messiah was coming regardless of what, what happened with man. God's timing was his timing. Um, Jesus is going to return at some point. Regardless of what humans do for the remainder of human existence, Jesus will return one day. It's going to happen. There are certain things in the timeline of God that are going to happen. But in our own individual worlds as well, I think it's fatalistic to think that just, it's just going to happen because if God wants to do it, will. I think there's a part where we need to step into what God has for us and we need to participate with the Holy Spirit and all that God wants to do in and through our lives and if you're here this morning and you're just kind of blase about spiritual things and just think well it doesn't matter you know I'm saved I'm going to heaven so my life will be exactly what God wants it to be I want to encourage you this morning uh, have a good think about that and dive into these ancient documents and have a look at what Jesus uh, taught have a look at what the apostle Paul taught have a look at the letters in the New Testament and then come to your conclusion do you really feel like we sit on the sidelines and have no part to play or is there a part where we need to get involved in what God is doing and actually walk with him because I believe we have a role to play in this Christian life Uh, in Acts chapter 2 verse 2 to 4 we've got that wonderful story of the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit gets poured out upon us and it says suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting then there appeared on them divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon each of them I love that idea there were 120 people there and you all got it Everybody got it. It wasn't just the 12 that got this, this, this gift of the Holy Spirit, this anointing, this fire, whatever it is you want to call it. It wasn't just the 12 that got it. 120 people, everybody in that room received this, this, this fire, this, the Holy Spirit, whatever terminology you want to use, the fire of the Spirit, the wind of the Spirit, whatever. The Holy Spirit came upon all of them that were in that room. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Did you know that from the minute you were born again and the Holy Spirit came to reside in you, there was a fire placed inside you by God? There was a fire placed on the inside of you by God. That Holy Spirit is referred to many times, uh, even in the Old Testament, the references to the Spirit uh, and this imagery of fire. And so when the Holy Spirit came into my life at 19 years of age, there was a fire that was placed inside of me. I believed that. I believed that there was a, a fire that was placed in me from God. But just because there was a fire placed in me, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that that fire is going to take off and consume everything in its path and become a raging, raging bushfire. I have the capacity to quench that spirit. And that's what that word quench actually means in 1 Thessalonians 5. It's the imagery of pouring water on a fire, a small ember that's, that's building. It's pouring water on the fire. I have the capacity to pour the water on that fire of the Holy Spirit in my life. But in the same way that I have the capacity to quench that, I also have the capacity to fan that thing into flame. I have the capacity to stir that thing up. 
So the Apostle Paul was very well aware of what could happen to a person if they let the flame die. Anybody here know, know somebody that you, once upon a time they came to faith and they were passionate about God and his word and, and, and their whole future looked different than what their past did because they'd realised that, you know, I was going in this way, now God is there and God's got a plan in the future and I'm seeking him and I'm living for his glory and so on. And you see this radical transformation, but then over time, Something happens. Instead of fanning that flame and building that, 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 that wind of the Spirit in their life, they, they moved into spaces where perhaps they began to quench that Spirit. Or sometimes we don't even have to quench a fire too. You know, if you leave a fire to its own devices, eventually, if it doesn't have fuel, it's going to die anyway. So sometimes we don't even deliberately quench it. But the fire will die if we do nothing. It's almost like to maintain a fire, there's a part that we play when it comes to maintaining a fire. We've got a fireplace uh, at home. The, one of the first things we put in when we moved to Ganelaba, my wife said to me, uh, you know, we need to have a, uh, sorry, I did. I said to her, we have to have a fireplace. It's too cold. I hate the cold. My joints get sore and everything. I don't like cold weather. I can't warm up. So I said, we've got to get a fireplace. So we did. The trade-off was, she said after the first summer, okay, I'm going to live up here. I hate being hot. We've got to get a pool. So that's been the last year of my life, probably trying to get this pool in. But um, there's this sense in which I, I put wood in the fire and I start it and I get the little fire starters, you know, the little sticks that you get. And yeah, and I light them and put them in and the fire starts going and I stand there like, like um, you know, what's his name and cast away Tom X. Fire! I've made fire! And, and then I'll walk away and I'll come back 10 minutes later and it's dead. So I open the door and and I'm blowing profusely. I've got ash going all over my face, but I don't care. I'm not going to lose that fire. I'm going to win. I'm going to keep that thing going. So I'm blowing in there, getting dust all over me, and then after a while, just flickers up again and goes, and I think, yes, I've won. I've got the fire going, you know. Jackie, come and have a look, kids. Have a look. Look what I did. And I shut the door, and I walk away feeling proud of myself, and I come back in five minutes' time, and it's dead again. So what do I do? I'm not going to be beat by this thing. I open the door, I stick my head in there, <laughs> dust's going, in, and I'll just keep on going. I've done this for an hour and a half to two hours some nights because I just will not be beaten by that fire. I'm not going to let that fire go out. And I look at my passion to keep that natural earthly fire going that's going to provide a bit of light and a bit of warmth for a few hours in my house and the lengths I will go to and the effort I'll put in to keep that fire going. But I've got to ask myself the question, when it comes to the fire of the Holy Spirit, do I have that kind of passion to keep that alive in my life as well? Or not? Am I prepared to sit back when I know? I know that flame's dying. I can see that flame dying. Am I going to be prepared to just look at it, know it's dying and go, no, oh, well, if God wants it to go, you know, God will, you know, somebody else wants it, they'll... Or do I have that same kind of passion for the work of the Holy Spirit in my own life and the fire of God that's been placed in my life. See, the Apostle Paul was very aware of what could happen if you let the flame die. Second Timothy, uh, it's the, the last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote before he was, 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 uh, went to his death, was killed for his faith. And he says a couple of things in that letter. Uh, in 2 Timothy 1.15, he says, This you know. He says, All those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are... For Gillis, which sounds like something I've been coughing up all week, and homogenous, which sounds like something that happens with the milk. Um, so Paul says, here, here are these people in Asia, these Christians, these churches, he said, they've turned away from me, and he mentions a few other people that have turned away from him as well. We don't know why they turned away. We actually don't fully understand why they turned away. Uh, but here's a guy, white hot for Jesus, Paul the Apostle, and for some reason, something happened, and they kind of, their flame, I guess, went out a little bit towards him. Maybe they didn't want to be associated with a guy that was so crazy for Jesus. Maybe they didn't want to be associated with a guy that was prepared to die for his faith or was on the wrong side of some of the religious authorities. I don't know why. But here's a, here are some people that have turned away from him. 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 10. He says this, he says, Be diligent to come to me quickly to Timothy, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and departed for Thessalonica. Here's a guy that, if, if you read up about Demas, he was, he was potentially part of Paul's ministry team at one point, really on <coughs> fire for God, loving Jesus, preaching the gospel, and now Paul's saying he just loved this world so much that the fire has gone out in his life. He's let that fire totally die. Ever know people like that? They just let the fire die. They let the fire die. You know, that could happen to me. That could happen to you. But we have a part to play in fanning that flame and keeping that fire going 
in our lives. In, in Paul's previous letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy, he's got a couple of, expre- couple of uh, stories there where he talks about other people where maybe the flame had gone out. 1 Timothy 1, 19 to 20. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith and have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. I don't want to get into all the details. What I want to do is say that here again are some people. It sounds to me like once upon a time, the fire was burning really bright for Jesus. Something happened. We don't know what happened, but now the flame is dying off for them. 1 Timothy 5.15. Paul says this. Some people here have already turned aside after Satan. In other words, they were heading in the right direction. Now they've turned aside. They were going with God. They were walking with us. They were part of us. But something's happened. They've allowed the flame in their heart to die. In other words, having the Holy Spirit doesn't guarantee victory in the Christian life because the Holy Spirit doesn't do everything. We work with the Holy Spirit in partnership with the Holy Spirit. And we're, all, we're, we're generally doing one of two things. We're either quenching the Spirit. It's interesting because quenching the Spirit is something that we do. It says that we quench the Spirit. The Spirit's natural propensity is not to quench himself in our life. The Holy Spirit is active. He's doing things. He's pointing us to Jesus. He's wanting us to to move to a place of of passion for the presence of God, for prayer, for the word of God. He's wanting us to shine a light in this world. He's wanting us to share the good news of Jesus with the world. That's the propensity. That's the, 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 the direction that the Holy Spirit is pushing us. But we, it says we have the capacity to quench that and to stop that. So having the Holy Spirit doesn't guarantee victory. We've got a part to play. Which leads me to what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. This is where I want to bounce off this morning. He says to Timothy, therefore, I remind you, I remind you. Keep in mind, he's, 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 he's obviously, where, where, where Timothy's pastoring, he's pastoring a church in Ephesus. And, and, and Paul has mentioned in his letters these people who were hot and cold and hot and cold and so on. And now he's going to, I can almost hear his heart going, Timothy, I think you're a great guy, but I'm, 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 I'm going to let you know that this could happen to you too. This could happen to any one of us. So I'm urging you as your father in the Lord. He says, I'm urging you, stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Stir up that gift of God. The NIV says, fan into flame the gift of God that's been placed in you. Now, theologically, we're not 100% certain what he means by gift of God. There are two trains of thought. Number one, that it was some type of spiritual gift that was imparted through the laying on of hands. Uh, if I look at the New Testament and the letters, there's not a great deal of, of times or evidence to suggest that spiritual gifts were imparted by the laying on of hands, so much as those gifts belong to the Spirit and they are imparted into you via the Holy Spirit when he comes into your world. We can get passionate and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. We need to, but I'm just saying in terms of the bigger picture, that's one train of thought is that he's talking about uh, when we got you together and we prayed over you, we imparted the gift of evangelist or gift of pastor. And so now stir that gift up. That's one theological train of thought. The other theological train of thought is that what Paul was talking about was actually the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if we go back and read in the book of Acts, we see several passages where the gift of the Holy Spirit was imparted through the laying on of hands throughout the time of the early church. Now, I believe when we come to faith that we receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? I believe that if you are born again in this place, you have the Holy Spirit. But if we go back and look in the book of Acts in the early days, there were several strategic, I believe they were missional opportunities, where at particular times the Holy Spirit was uh, imparted through the laying on of hands with, with different gifts manifest and so on. But the point is that one of the other theological options is that it's the Holy Spirit that Paul's talking about. And if that's the case, then what Paul's saying is stir up the Holy Spirit in you. Fan into flame the Holy Spirit in you. This tends to make more sense to me because he goes on in the very next verse and he talks about what kind of spirit you have. He says, stir up the gift of God that was given to you through the laying on of my hands for God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. And he goes, I said, you've got a spirit of love, of, of, of discipline, of a sound mind. And he describes aspects where elsewhere in the Bible the Holy Spirit is described as these types of things. Acts 1.8, you'll receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He's saying here the spirit you've got is a spirit of power. It's a spirit of discipline, spirit of... Uh, and, and so I tend to lean towards that, that what Paul's saying here is, is that the Holy Spirit's been deposited in your life, Timothy. And there's been a whole lot of train wrecks and shipwrecks in the past. I don't want you to be one of them. So I'm encouraging you, play your role and stir yourself up. Amen? Stir yourself up in God. Stir up the Holy Spirit that's actually inside of you right now. Because if you're not stirring up that fire and you leave that fire to its natural direction, you know what happens with a fire? It dies. It generally dies. 
And I wonder in this room whether we ever think about that, whether we ever think about the fact that the Holy Spirit is like a fire inside of us and that we have the capacity to quench that fire and pour water on it. What it means here, that literal image in the Greek of fan into flame, it's the same thing. It's a fire and doing what I did with the fireplace. It's blowing wind on that fire so that that fire would take off. That's the exact imagery that the Greek word uh, is expressing when it says fan into flame or stir up the gift of God. Breathe into it. Blow on it. Make sure that that thing doesn't die because if you leave it to its own devices, it may die. And so God's doing things at the moment. And I know that because we talk to a lot of people in the life of the church and it's very clear that people are saying to me, I'm getting more hungry for the word of God. You know what? That is not the devil and it's not the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit. People are saying to me, I'm really hungry for prayer and I'm enjoying prayer and I'm diving into... You know what? That is not the devil and that is not your flesh because they don't want prayer. That's the Holy Spirit if you're getting hungry for prayer. People are saying, I'm hungry to worship. I'm hungry for the presence of God. I'm wanting to get into the word of God. And I'm hearing those testimonies. And and I'm I'm saying that that is a work of the Holy Spirit. So there's a, a sense in which that fire is bubbling away and there's things that God's doing in your heart. But the challenge is, are you going to just sit back and let it just run its natural course and have the case sarah sarah attitude? Or do you understand that that thing's being fanned up, cooperate with the Holy Spirit and stir up the Spirit of God in your life. Fan into flame what God is doing in your life. Amen? Fan into flame what God is doing in your life. I want to ask you a question. Is your life combustible enough to keep the fire of the Holy Spirit burning? You know, I was, I was reading the other day, and anyone that works with fire would know this, the fire triangle. You heard the fire triangle? Fire needs heat, and it needs oxygen, and it needs fuel. It's interesting to me on the day of Pentecost that we have fire. There's the heat. We have the sound of a rushing wind. There's the oxygen. And then we have the fuel which was these people that were passionate for Jesus. These people in the upper room who were praying and worshipping and and, and believed in the resurrection and had sold themselves out. There was more than 120 people throughout the ministry of Christ who claimed to attach themselves to him and wanted to follow him, be part of the crowds and some. But when the push came to shove, there was something about these 120 people. There was something in their life that made them an extremely combustible fuel. And when the heat and the wind came, there was enough combustibleness in their life that it took off. And they went out and they took this message of the goodness of God to the ends of the earth. And the question is, in our lives, do we have, are our lives combustible enough to keep that fire going? What I want to do is just very quickly leave you with six simple little things. Six little things that I think are part of that fuel in our life. Things that we can do in our own world to stir up the Holy Spirit. Things that we can do to fan into flame the Holy Spirit in our life. I gave my life to Jesus when I was 19. And let me tell you something. Back in those early days, man, you couldn't stop me telling someone about Jesus. You could not stop me. My friends started to hate me because I just wanted to tell them about Jesus. I dragged them along to church. And to be honest, I got every one of my mates, I got them all to come to a church service. They probably thought I was an idiot and they probably hated it and they probably only did it because I was their mate. Every one of my mates came and walked into a church service and sat through a message with me and, and so on. I did everything I could to try to get Jesus to them. I, I couldn't get enough of the word of God. I just could not get enough of it. It was more important to me than rugby league week. I could not get enough of prayer. The thought that I could sit down in my bedroom by myself and talk to God and know that he was present in that room with me and know that I didn't have to say fancy words. I didn't have to say certain phrases. I could talk to God like I was talking to my best friend and know that God was there and he saw my heart and understood. And know, without a shadow of a doubt, I had faith that if I asked God something, he was going to meet that need. He was going to answer that question. But it's amazing as time goes on and that kind of dissipates and dies down. And I just, I just feel, again, that there's this hunger burning again. I want to get back to those days. I want to get back to that place because one day I'm going to stand before him. Every one of us, we're going to stand before him one day. And we hear this a lot and we all know this, but I'm going to say it again anyway. One day I'm going to stand before him. I'm going to look at Jesus and I'm going to stand there surrounded by the saints and so on. And I'm going to, to, to maybe I won't, I don't know because I'm, I'm not in heaven yet, but I wonder whether I'm going to have a moment to go, if I really really, really took this that serious and really, God, what would I have done different with all that time I had down there? What would I have done different? What could I have done down there to fan up the Holy Spirit in my life? And who knows what the Holy Spirit could do in me and through me if I continue to work with him and not against him?
If I continue to put myself in a place that's going to fan that flame, I wonder what my life could look like in six months, in 12 months, in two years, in five years, in 50 years. Who knows? Who knows? But I know this. The challenge before me is this. Will I quench that fire of the Holy Spirit or am I going to fan it into flame? So six very simple things that we can do to fan into flame. They're not a huge revelation, but I want to throw them at you and I want you to have a think about them. Number one, first thing is I think we need to be people who just take initiative. Take initiative. Acts chapter 16 and verse 6 to 9 says this. It says, When they had gone, this is Paul and his missionary bunnies, they went through Phrygia, region of Galatia. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they'd come to Messiah, they tried to go into Bithynia. So they're trying to go out and preach the gospel. Eventually, they have this vision of a man from Macedonia. Now, here's the thing. Why do you think they were trying to go into these places that the Holy Spirit eventually forbid them to go anyway? I think they were going because they remembered something Jesus said. You've read it. I've read it. It's in Matthew 28. He said, go. Where did he say go? He just said, go into all the world. And what are you going to do when you get out there? He said, just preach the gospel to them. Tell them about the goodness of God. And so these guys just literally went, okay, Jesus, you said that. My default setting in life is going to be obey the things I already know to do. That's my default setting. I'm just going to... Obey the things that I already know to do. I'm not sitting in a prayer closet waiting for a shining light for God to say, yes, forgive your neighbor. No, no, no. Jesus already said forgive, so I'm going to live a life of forgiveness. I'm not going to wait and, 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 and wait for you know, ducks to fly across my head and fleeces to be dry and everything in order for me to love my wife. No, no. It says love your wife, so I'm going to love my wife. I'm not going to wait for uh, you know, special signs and visions and dreams of, of Jesus in front of me saying, tell that person. No, no, if I get the opportunity to tell someone about Jesus, I'm going to open my mouth and I'm going to tell them about Jesus because there are so many things that I've already been told to do. And so I want my life to be one that takes initiative and lines up. My default setting is going to be obedience. Amen? My default needs to be obedience because that's the direction the Holy Spirit's already going. So if I make initiative to just do what I already know to do, part of the default setting of my life, I know this, I am already flowing in step with the Spirit. I believe I'm fanning into flame what the Holy Spirit wants to do in my life. And if I'm working in the opposite direction, there's a very good chance I'm probably quenching what the Holy Spirit wants to do in my life. So I'm going to take initiative. I'm going to do what I already know to do. I think that's one way that we fan into flame that, that what the Holy Spirit is doing in us and the gift of God in our life. And so I'd ask you the question, is your default obedience? Are you doing the things you already know to do? Because I would encourage you, that's one way that we fan into flame what God is doing. Second thing I would suggest is faith. Be people of faith. Be people of trust. Believe God. Amen? Believe God. Mark chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. It says that Jesus, when he went back to his own hometown, said he couldn't do any mighty miracles. In the Greek, it literally means he healed a few headaches and minor. It says minor ailments. Now, this is the same Jesus that stilled storms and raised Lazarus from the dead and so on. It says when he went home, it says not that he didn't want to do anything major. It says he couldn't. It says he couldn't. I don't understand everything about everything, but I know enough from reading the Gospels and the letters and so on in the New Testament to know that while I'm not an extreme uh, word of faith person that, you know, just name it and claim it, I don't believe in that, but I can't deny the fact that faith plays a role in releasing whatever it is that God wants to do. And and for some reason, when, when I quench that faith, I have the capacity to stop God doing some things that he wants to do. So if that's the case, then I want to be the kind of person that fans into flame God. I want to lean more towards faith and believing God and trusting God and believing that God can do the things that he says as opposed to naturally defaulting the other way. If I default the other way, I think I'm like this crown here in Nazareth. I think what they did there was they quenched the spirit. Because it doesn't say Jesus didn't want to. It says he couldn't. There was a sense in which the environment created held back whatever it is that he wanted to do there. So if that's true, I want to make sure that to the best of my ability that I'm creating an environment of faith around me where I'm trusting God. That way I can be fanning into flame that gift of God. And we don't need more faith. This is the thing. I think we think that before we can step out in God and trust God and do things, we, we, there's so many people sit back thinking that I've just, I just need to build my faith a bit. Jesus said this in Luke 7, 17 verse 6. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can uproot a tree. It's interesting, when Jesus talked about faith, he didn't say you've got to get your faith way up here before you can start stepping out and trusting me and believe me. He said, man, dudes, all you need is a mustard seed. It's not a lot. You don't have to be some great super faith hero. He said, all all you've got to do is find a mustard seed of faith inside you and start trusting me. And faith is not about 
my head going, I agree. I, I see people's faith in their actions, amen? Faith becomes real to me when I take an action step towards whatever it is that I'm talking about. I can say I believe in, in healing, in laying hands on the sick and, and, and God can heal them through me. I can say that. But I, I don't show that until I actually see someone sitting here, would you mind if I laid my hands on you and prayed for you? There's an action that shows where I'm standing with that faith. I can say, God, I trust you financially for this, that, and the other, and I believe that I should give and be generous and that you'll... But you know what? It, it doesn't really, really become real to me until I start being generous and giving to, to others or to the needs or whatever and so on. There, there's a sense in which where faith is not just something that we say we have, it's something that others look at us and go, you've got that. I can see the difference that that's making in your life. And so faith is a way that we fan the flame into uh, fan the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in our life. Are we people that naturally default towards faith where we fan that thing into flame or do we naturally default towards unbelief therefore potentially quenching what the Holy Spirit wants to do? Which way of the ledger do we lean? A third thing that fans into flame is thankfulness. Being people who are thankful, looking for the good in our life and focusing in on the good things. How many of you have got bad things going on right now? How many of you have got reasons why you can be bitter and twisted and messed up? I've got 100,000 of them, I'm telling you. I could, just, I could just have a lecture for a week and just throw it all out there, all the rubbish and the junk and the stuff that's going real pear-shaped in my life right now. But if I want to stay in a place where I'm focused in on that, you know what that's going to do? That's like shutting the door in my fire, turning off the airflow, and that spirit is just getting quenched and eventually is going to die. And I know too many people, they got caught up on, well, we prayed for that person, they didn't get healed, and we focus in on that, and now six months later, I don't have faith anymore, I don't think God's good anymore, I want nothing to do with him, I prayed for this thing, and God didn't meet that need, or I asked for this, or that, and we get caught up on some of that stuff instead of going, here's the deal, I woke up this morning, picked up a newspaper, my name was not in the obituary section, so I decided it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. I breathed in air this morning. I woke up and my God gave me another day on planet Earth. He gave me breath to breathe. I had a coffee this morning. My wife made me a coffee. God gave me a good woman. She made me a coffee. It was an Arise coffee, but it was a good woman that made the coffee. I got a car. I got a roof over my head today. We, we got umbrellas. We could walk out. Like There are so many good things in my life right now. But if I want to focus on all the negative stuff and lose my grateful and thankful heart, it will squash and put water on that fire. It will not fan it into flame. So what is my default setting? What is your default setting? Are we going to be people that lean towards gratefulness and thankfulness? Or are we going to lean the other way? One way quenches the spirit. The other way fans into flame that which the Holy Spirit is doing. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 19, which is uh, 16 through to 19, which is linked up to this concept of quenching the spirit. And he says, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything, give thanks. I'm not giving thanks, God, because the circumstance and everything is always what you want. There are a lot of circumstances in my life I don't believe God wants for me, but they're there anyway. I'm not thanking God for that crappy circumstance, but I'm going to thank God in the midst of it anyway because that's the right thing to do. I'm going to maintain a stance of gratitude, gratefulness, and thankfulness. Why? Because I know in my life, if I stay in that place and that becomes my default, guess what? I'm fanning that flame. And if I go the other way, here's what I'm doing. I'm pouring water on that flame and I'm quenching the Spirit. And I don't want to quench the Spirit. Number four, prayer. Prayer. Prayer is something that fans the flame of God in our life, something that fans the work of the Spirit in our life. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, the, these believers have been uh, uh, preaching and they got taken away and they got criticized and, and, and whipped and, and so on and told, don't ever do it again. And so they come back and when they catch up with the rest of the believers, they go, we were just treated this way, blah, blah, blah. Rather than shutting up like the authorities said, they said, we're going to pray to God and we're going to keep doing what we did. And it says that they had prayed and the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They got together, they prayed, and the place where they were was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. These are people that are already filled with the Holy Spirit, by the way. But there's a sense there in which, again, there's this other outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They're filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with great 
great boldness. After being threatened not to preach again, the Holy Spirit comes in the midst of prayer and puts something inside of them and they go, we have more resolve now to go out there and to continue to do what God has called us to do. And I find that with prayer. Prayer puts me in a place where I'm constantly reminded of the power of God. I'm constantly reminded of the reality of God. I don't do this journey alone. I can't. I need God. I need God. And if my default setting is leading me towards prayer, every time I pray, here's the thing, the devil doesn't want me to pray and my flesh doesn't want to pray because I kind of die to myself the more time I spend in prayer. So the flesh is not wanting me to pray, the devil's not wanting me to pray, but God is. God is. And so when I make prayer my default in life, I'm fanning the flame of the Holy Spirit. When I ignore prayer and think I can work it all out and do it all myself, I'm quenching the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Which way, which side of the ledger do you lean in? I came in here this week and as I said, I've been having a tough, hard time of life for a long period now. And and I crawled into here this week, we've been a bit crook in that, but I thought, now I've got to get out of bed and I've got to go and do something because I, I, I could feel that, I could feel literally that, 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 that flame. Oh, uh, uh, pastors are no different to anybody else. We've got to keep fanning that flame. And I could feel that flame going down. I dragged myself in here. I come up here, I laid down on the stage. I just laid there and I thought, I'm going to try to pray. I thought, I don't know what to pray. So I'm just going to lay here, God, because I can't do it. And, and all of a sudden, this, what I'm talking about here, this, this thing bubbled up inside me. And, and I felt like, like, like God was saying to me, you know what? You've got to fan this thing into flame. I've done everything I can do. I've done everything. I, I'm right here. But you've got to fan this thing into flame. And so while I'm literally laying there feeling like the bottom has fallen out of my world, I just started to, I said, right, I've got to, I've, I've got to get up. So I sat up and I stood up right here. And I just started saying, okay, God, um, this feels really dumb. But God, you're good. Lord, you are, you're faithful. God, I know right now I've got all this, but, but God, I know in my heart you're faithful, Lord. And God, I know that I can trust you. And I've got all, but I know I can trust you, Lord. And this circumstance is there. But you know what, God, I know that you ultimately have power and you can change that for me. And the more I started pacing up and down here and I felt this thing burning up on the inside, mate, I finished that prayer. I could have gone for a 20 kilometer run. I felt so good after that. But I had to stir myself up. I had to pick myself up and put myself in a place to do that. But it would have been so much easier not to. I'm telling you now, it would have been so much easier not to. And the thing is that it's so much easier to quench the Holy Spirit in our life than it is to fan the Holy Spirit into flame. But both of them require participation from me. So which one am I going to lean towards? What's going to be my default setting towards the quenching of the Spirit or the fanning into flame, the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Number five, real quick, worship. Worship. Acknowledging who God is. You ever, you ever, you ever stop and just think, God is actually, like, he, he, he's actually God. <laughs> like, not just a concept of God, but there was nothing, and he said, let there be. And everything that exists is here because he's allowing it to be. And he's keeping it together by his word. And if he wanted to, it could all be over. He's not just someone that might be able to heal a deaf person. Or someone that might be able to get you out of debt if you're struggling financially. Or somebody who might be able to find you a life partner. Or somebody who might be able to... No, no. If he wanted it over, it could be over. It's amazing. There was nothing. And he just said, let there be. And I don't understand it all and my finite human peanut brain can't get a grip on it. But I have faith in it. I believe it. And when we worship God, we fan into flame. The natural default setting for man is to worship himself. We want to worship ourselves, And we do that so often and in so many subtle ways. But when we come to worship, we abandon ourselves and we give it all over to God. And worship is a way that we fan into flame. And people like to worship different ways, and maybe you're not an expressive worshiper. That's fine. I'm not saying it has to be done a certain way. What I'm saying is when we step into a place of worship, we fan into flame. We fan into flame that which the Holy Spirit is doing. At midnight, Acts chapter 16, verse 25, 26, at midnight, Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. Hey, 
they would have loved to have had what we had this morning. Dave up there with the black tracks, they would have loved it. But they had nothing. They're sitting in a dungeon with rats and smells and it's dark and it's underground and they just start singing hymns to God with prisoners around them. Probably at the start, maybe the prisoners were saying, shut up, I don't want to hear this rubbish. Turn your Christian music off. But they worshipped. They sat there at midnight, the darkest time of day, night, <laughs> and they worshipped. It says, as they worshipped, suddenly there was a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately, all the doors were opened. Everyone's chains were loosed. I love that. It wasn't just their chains. Their capacity to worship, stir up the spirit in their own life, had an impact on the people around them. Their other people's chains were loosed too. It's not just about us. What's your natural default? Do you worship God? Are you a worshipper of God or do you tend to worship more yourself? Is, is, is it about him or is it really more about you? Because one of them quenches the work of the Holy Spirit. The other one fans into flame. That which God wants to do in our hearts. And the last one, fellowship. Genuine, God-ordained fellowship. And fellowship, by the way, the word quinone is not just about a bunch of people together in a room. It's, it's not a church word. It doesn't come from a Christian background. It was used to describe a group of people in, say, a village when the leaders of the village would come together in the, in, 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 like a council and they would discuss issues that pertain to... It's, it's a group of people not just gathering together but a group of people coming together for the common purpose. And when the church gathers together, we gather for a common purpose. It's not just about being here. It's about being here with that common purpose of worshipping God, of making disciples of glorifying Jesus in the earth. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 25, and let us consider one another in order to stir up. You know that word in the Greek, stir up? It literally means to incite and to irritate. So Pete, sorry, but I'm called to irritate you, mate. Okay? But what are we irritating and inciting them towards? It says towards love and good works. Not forsaking the gathering together of ourselves as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as we see the day approaching. There are good irritations in life and part of the gathering together is we should be irritating and inciting each other towards love and good works. So not only, not only being in fellowship, how do we get stirred up in fellowship? Well, we get stirred up because I want to be in a gathering of people. I want you to incite me to love and good works. I want you to irritate me towards love and good works. I need it. You know why? Because that's what fans the flame of the Holy Spirit in my life. And if I avoid that kind of a community and I stay away from that and I don't want to get around people that are going to irritate and incite me towards love and good works, guess what the default setting is then? I'm getting irritated and incited towards things other than that. But if I want to keep fanning that flame in my life, I've got to be around the right kinds of people and I find them in the concept of this thing that we call Christian fellowship. I find it in the concept of the church. So I just want to leave you with those six little things. Number one, uh, initiative. Doing what you know to do. Number two, faith. Just starting where you are and just doing what, what you can with the faith you've got. Number three, thankfulness. Looking for the good, focusing in on that. Number four, prayer, which is about keeping an awareness of God. Number five, worship, which is about acknowledging the power of God. Number six, fellowship, operating in God's new community. I leave you with a challenge. What are you going to do this week in the next seven days? Are you going to lean towards your, a, a natural default of quenching the Holy Spirit? Or are you going to lean towards fanning into flame the fire of God in your life. It is a choice. Quenching and fanning are both something I do. I'm not going to sit back and say, God, you do it all. God's saying, hey, I've done what I've done. I've started the fire. Like the old Billy Joel song. Remember that song, We Didn't Start the Fire? Hey, We didn't start the fire. God did. He sent his spirit to live inside of us. We didn't start the fire. He started the fire. But we got a role to play in keeping that thing going. Amen? Amen. So Lord, I just pray for each of us in this room. God, it's one thing to sit here on a Sunday, one thing to talk about stuff in the Bible, it's one thing to amen, it's one thing to nod. Lord, it's another thing to get up out of these chairs, each of us here to walk away and to actually live it and to do it. And Father, I pray, Lord, would you challenge us in these next seven days, challenge us in the week ahead. God, are we living a life that is quenching the work of the Spirit in and through us? Or are we living a life that is fanning into flame that gift of the Spirit? Lord, are we pouring water on the Holy Spirit that you have so graciously given to us? Or are we adding fuel to the fire so that that thing can burn and rage and provide warmth and light for not just ourselves, but for the people around us as well? Lord, I pray that you would challenge us this week with that concept, Father. And Lord, as we leave this place too, God, I pray in the next seven days, there's a lot of people out there, God, that do not know you, a lot of people in our community that have no understanding that there is a God in heaven that loves them, so much so that he sent his only son to die for them, Lord. 
God, would you give us the opportunity in the next seven days to tell somebody out there about the goodness of God, somebody that needs to hear it, that doesn't know about it. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.